Um, so I think uh, we'll try to get started here, and uh, I'll just uh, open Owen's presentation. He should have uh, an intro uh, presentation, and uh, we can move forward from here. Yeah, good morning, everyone. I'm going to make this very brief just so we can get back up on, on track, et cetera. We have the agenda that's been circulated around, um, and uh, so we're really happy that everyone's joining us here today. Um, I'm not going to spend much time on the agenda if you want to just flip down quickly, Jeff. Um, we're going to try and still get this all finished by 12 o'clock this afternoon so everyone can get on. Uh, we, we have a number of uh, people who've joined us, but I want to make special mention if you can. Jeff's just going down one more slide. Um, with, we have a new collaboration partner, and uh, Kate Kuznetsov, Kuznetsova, my apology, Kate, from Reaction Biology has joined us, and she's going to give a uh, presentation, hopefully if she's available to speak, on uh, the ELK2 relevant assays uh, today, and also about Reaction Biology's uh, 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 special uh, um, uh, whatever the uh, assays are they're going to run. Just going one quick comment on here for all the other partners who are on the line. What uh, we will be doing later on, uh, and we'll talk about it on the web page that we're updating between now and the next meeting. Uh, we're going to list all our collaboration partners, and if you would like to send over to us a high definition uh, logo and a short blurb, we're happy to add those to our web page. Um, I'm not going to spend much more time on here. I'm going to pass it back to you, Jeff, so we can try and catch up on our time. All Thank right. you. Good. Um, yeah. All right, so I'm going to just quickly uh, give a brief intro uh, again to the project and then talk about the action items from the previous meeting. Um, so, again, I think everyone should know, you know, the, the lead profile of the molecules we're, we're looking for. Basically, we're looking for a brain penetrant top 2 inhibitor uh, for the treatment of DIPG. And a CTIP uh, application was submitted. Uh, and the lead target profile is uh, laid out here. I think uh, this is, these are really great targets to get us started. So we're looking for, you know, enzymatic uh, potency less than 10 nanomolar. Uh, with cell activity less than 100 nanomolar, uh, some cell kill against some DIPG cell lines less than 500 nanomolar. Hopefully we can be much better than that. Uh, we're looking for selectivity against ALK3 and especially ALK5 with more than 500 fold and, and no activity against uh, or, uh, other kinases. So, you know, I think uh, this is a good enough place to get us started. I think the lead compound uh, looks pretty good with respect to this, but there's still some work to do with respect to ALK5 selectivity, but I, I think the SAR that we've started to see recently has shown us uh, some avenues that, that will help us uh, achieve those goals. Of course, we need some uh, reasonable in vitro uh, ADME uh, to, in order to get the good in vivo PK, but as well, uh, a key issue with this, as I mentioned, is this brain penetration. Um, so, you know, um, and, and then, you know, we'll be looking at some in vivo efficacy models as well. So, uh, the deliverable, deliverables and milestones I put here just uh, to remind everyone, but basically we have essentially 18 months to drive the SAR to get to a potential candidate that allows us to get in vivo and, and start looking at some uh, in vivo efficacy models. So. Um, we put together this ALK2 uh, project flow scheme and we presented this at the last meeting uh, where you know, we're having uh, synthesis uh, for now at least at OICR and at Charles River. Uh, ICR is actually working on a backup series uh, and, and we'll hopefully get those people involved very soon. Um, we want to screen in the biochemical assay and you know, we started to generate some data around this. You'll see that later in later in today's presentation. But really, a, a key point um, uh, that differentiates this ALK2 project from the uh, typical FOP-based ALK2 projects are that you know, the FOP disease is really driven by a single uh, mutation, and about 96% is the R206H. Whereas in ALK2 uh, in DIPG, there's 
several mutations, including this up 206H. There's also some 328Vs and, 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 and some other ones. I, you'll see throughout the, the, the course of this presentation today that you know, we really want to be able to profile against these other mutants early in the project to make sure that we are hitting these mutants. We have some preliminary evidence from the early SAR that the R206H mutants are, well, we are hitting them, but you know, we do need to gather this information. And certainly uh, Kate at RBC has been very helpful and, and they have some of these mutants and, and hope, I think she's going to talk about that later and, and uh, we're going to profile a set of compounds very, very soon against these mutants. So uh, that'll be exciting data to have and then you know, moving forward from that, uh, we'll have to move into cellular assays, the ADME, you know, we've got fossil SMAD target engagement uh, assays, and then moving in vivo. So uh, hopefully we can get through some of this, and we're starting to move the initial set of compounds at least through this first set of assays. All right, so let's move on to the action items from the last meeting. I think we had a really great meeting uh, there just before uh, Christmas on December 12th. We had a lot of really great discussion. It was a good kickoff meeting, and uh, I put together some minutes. I hope everyone on the line has seen them and read them and uh, had the opportunity to provide feedback. Um, so I'll just go through these action items kind of one by one and give you a kind of summary update in terms of where things are. So there is a, a nanobreath-based uh, uh, cellular assays uh, that have been developed by ProMega, and Alex is going to give us an update on these today. Uh, hopefully, presumably he can speak at some point. Um, I think he's made some exciting progress here, and I look forward to seeing. Uh, I look forward to seeing that um, on the. Uh, in vitro biochemical assays, so you know we considered both Eurofins and RBC, and as, as Owen mentioned, RBC has really um, graciously agreed to uh, support the project uh, in the following way. So they're going to test an initial set of 30 compounds versus a set of five kinases. Uh, so we've selected these 30 compounds, and they're all ready to go. Uh, they're all ready to ship out. One of the discussion points for today is around which five kinases we should test. We have a proposal, but before we made that final decision, we wanted to vet it with the, the team, so you'll see that today. Um, they've also agreed to test 20 compounds per month against three kinases, so, you know, I think the data that we get here will really drive what those three kinases are. I'm thinking, at least right now, that it'll be OP2, OP5, and OP1, but, you know, I think we really need to see uh, this data first and making sure that we're active against the mutants. They've also agreed to test uh, uh, several compounds per month against uh, an, an additional two kinases, so, you know, important compounds, key SAR compounds, uh, to try to uh, really make sure that we're on track. And then uh, they've also agreed to test five compounds in the first year against the full kinome. Uh, so that'll be an outstanding data set that, that will really help us figure out where we are uh, and, and where we need to go. And so, um, as uh, Owen also mentioned, Kate has joined the project team and hopefully she's going to give a, a presentation. Now, Kate, I think you, can, you are able to speak, right? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. hi Kate. Welcome to the, the only team. Thing, I don't see any slides on my screen. You don't see any slides on your screen? Yeah, yeah. all I see is a gray window and nothing popping up since we started. Okay. We are sharing, but why are they not? Oh. Now I see a cover screen with a laptop. Yeah. Can you use you are okay. now showing? It came up now, yes. You see? Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, yeah. Great. Um, so next action item was Owen was to look at the budget to, to determine how much we can spend on outsourcing. If you recall from the uh, from, from this slide, we do have a lot of outsourcing that will have to happen, especially later on. 
uh, on the in vivo side, and so Owen has confirmed that there is some money available for outsourcing. And we talked about uh, what we could do over the next little while as well, so we set aside some money for your yes, you as needed. Yeah. Exactly. Right. So uh, th this uh, looks good. Um, Owen uh, is looking into enabling the M4K website, and I think we'll see a, an update uh, later today about this. Um, Al had a great suggestion about you know identifying a vendor or a lab capable of really becoming a one-stop shop DIPG um, place where a lot of the different meetings could be held and, and, and some of the uh, cell-based assays. And I think this is an inspirational goal. I think it would be really good, but there hasn't been a lot of movement, on, at least on my side on that front. And I know Al uh, mentioned that he doesn't want to speak at, at this meeting. That, uh, so he, uh, he probably can't comment here, but I think this is something that we should keep in mind moving forward, and, and, and hopefully this is something that we can enable. Um, we should look at uh, developing a drug being delivered orally uh, and by oral suspension, and you know, I think based on the profile of the drug uh, that we identify, you know, that the dosing regimen still remains to, to be defined. So. This is uh, still a work in progress, but uh, we're, we're all starting to think about this. Uh, team should consider looking at uh, potential alternative targets uh, other than ALP2 to try to treat uh, DIPG. Uh, there are some suggestions about PDG or alpha, uh, some PI3K, you know, there's other targets that hit the PRC2, like E and EZH2, that, that might be interesting as potential uh, other brain penetrant uh, projects, but uh, you know we all agree that you know uh, the project for now should focus on up two as, as, as really that's what uh, has driven the funding uh, to this point. But we should really try to get to a point where we can test the hypothesis uh, as soon as possible, um, because we are looking at a brain penetrant uh, project. Um, and OICR is doing the bulk of the ADME, or in vitro ADME on this uh, project. We agreed that following the MDCK and the MDCK MDR1, uh, to look at the potential for uh, blood-brain barrier penetration uh, is, is a good idea. We agreed to bring this in-house, and Charles River agreed to, to help us uh, bring that in-house, and the tech transfer is, has occurred. Um, CAD is working uh, closely with AMA to be able to bring this assay into OICR. Hopefully over the coming months we'll get this thing up and running uh, uh, as soon as possible. Um, there are other uh, literature known out two compounds uh, and we should consider modeling and crystallography to use this data to help drive SAR. So uh, on our end, and I know the same thing has happened at Charles River, we have a modeling uh, program uh, that, that's available to all of the chemists involved in the projects to model ideas based on several different x-ray structures and you know we've taken a look at the blueprint, the Tolero, the Novartis, uh, the new Novartis compounds and you know these have been modeled. The synthesis of some of these analogs has uh, been initiated uh, at Charles River and we'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and so you know we are using all available information to try to generate ideas in this project and to, to try to drive the project as, as fast as possible. Um, during the chemistry presentation at the last meeting, there was a, 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 some talk from, uh, about some work that was ongoing with uh, Greg Cooney and, and, and Alexi uh, regarding some very structurally similar analogs to our leads that were targeted against uh, Rib K2. And so, you know, we wanted to see what kind of SAR they had done and whether or not, you know, we don't want to reinvent the wheel essentially. If they, already made some analogs that are replacing the trimethoxy group and we, we wanted to try to get some access to that information. And so we've had some initial discussions with Greg and with Alexis and uh, it was a very great discussion. I think you know their project was clearly target, targeted against our RIP K2. They've made about 80 analogs, but they have tested most of these analogs uh, for their L2 activity. Uh, they're in the progress uh, of, of writing the paper, and uh, they, they have agreed to, to share their data with us as soon as possible. 
So we look forward to seeing that. We're also looking at, at ways of getting them more involved uh, in the project team and, and looking at ways, uh, some funding possibilities to try to make that happen. So uh, hopefully uh, we can uh, get that data sooner rather than later so that it can impact our SAR. Um, there was some talk about uh, disconnect between target engagement, um, so the, the, the SMAD phosphorylation and, and uh, the uh, luciferase-based data uh, that we had generated and uh, the DIPG cell line-based proliferation. Uh, this is still something that needs to be worked out, but I think in order to further evaluate that, we still need better compounds and uh, also some uh, other cell lines. So this is still something that, that's on the radar that we need to continue to monitor. Um, Capacity of crystallography in, the, in Oxford is about six to eight structures per month, potentially less than that. Um, Alex talked about looking at ALK2 and ALK5, and potentially some other off-target uh, based kinases. Uh, and ALK1 was also uh, identified as a potential issue for safety. And um, this is something that we also need to uh, continue to monitor and, and uh, this is ALK1 activity was also observed um, in the new Novartis patent as something that was they couldn't dial out and we've had some preliminary discussions with um, um, Boringer Ingelheim and about their ALK2 project and, and it seems like ALK1 was very difficult for them uh, to dial out as well. So, yeah. Hello? Hi everyone, this is Oxford. We've got Paul Brennan, sure. Alex Bullock and John Sue here. All right, we can hear you. That's great. All right, looks like things are getting sorted out slowly. Uh, again, sorry for all of the uh, the uh, the confusion, but we are test driving a, a couple of uh, uh, of new meeting formats. Um, but hopefully, we get all of the uh, issues ironed out with this one. Moving forward, we'll be fine. Um, yeah, each compound. Uh, Oh, monthly team meetings should be scheduled, so Owen and I are continuously working on this. We were able to schedule this one. We actually had to move it to February 6th because of uh, uh, scheduling conflicts. We're working on the next one. Uh, we have a tentative date uh, scheduled, but uh, that's, that's still a work in progress, and hopefully we can get that finalized very soon. Uh, again, a couple of conflicts, but with a team this size, it's, uh, it, it's, it's difficult to get everyone together, and so I... I hope everyone understands that you know we have to schedule these, and uh, you know we'll do our best to accommodate everyone. But it is a pretty large, large group, so um, we'll, we'll move forward as we have to. Um, each compound that gets synthesized, we talked about every every compound having an M4K number, so that we're all speaking the same language with, in, in this project, and I think that was well received. Um, on our end, we're still optimizing the database. Uh, process and the compound registration. Uh, we hope over the coming weeks to be able to finalize this, at least to get uh, the first iteration. I think that you know, there will be um, learnings as we as we move forward with so many sites, but uh, this is something that we sh hope to have in place over the next couple of weeks uh, so that we can uh, share uh, data uh, across sites. And uh, I'll, I'll speak to this a little bit later as well. Um, we talked about profiling an initial set of compounds through the cascade. So this, we had an initial set of, of 14 compounds that we had uh, previously obtained uh, to support the CTIP application, and we profiled those. Uh, I'll go through some of the SAR uh, in a little bit, um, uh, but uh, this is a work in progress again. As I mentioned, we, we've just obtained 17 more compounds, so you know, this, this group of 30 or 31 compounds will be uh, profiled over the coming month. Um, we should target 25 megs of each individual compound because we do have to, to share the, the compounds across several sites to get all of the work done. So uh, this is something that everyone agreed to. And um, everybody, you know, we talked about how the shipping to, to various places should go. And again, uh, that was something that everyone agreed to. So. Uh, without further ado, I think that's the end of my section, and uh, I think uh, from here we can go uh, and look at Kate's presentation. Is that all right, Kate? Yeah, sure. All 
All right. So, so, so again, uh, you know, Kate comes to us from from RBC, Reaction Biology, Biology Corporation, and uh, you know that they really generously stepped up to the plate for this project. So we thought it would be nice for Kate to give us a little overview of what RBC can offer, and, and uh, especially uh, as it pertains to this project. So, hello, everyone. Um, I just have a very few slides to cover uh, what RBC is all about and then specifically ALK-related uh, targets. So you might know us from other collaborations, but we're a small private contract research <coughs> organization, and we were founded in 2001, so we've been around for a while. And we're located in Malvern, which is a little bit north of Philadelphia. And even though we've expanded over the years, we're still quite small. We only have about 54 uh, employees, but we do have distributors across the world, actually. And then we specialize in uh, early drug discovery services with main focus on kinases as well as uh, different uh, epigenetic targets. And then if you put all of our sort of offering together, we have about 1,000 targets, and we offer both biochemical and uh, biophysical detection services. And then we have a smaller cell um, biology uh, experimental section, and then we have a collection of over 100 cell lines and then a variety of assays and detection technologies. And we're also excited, and uh, this year we've added uh, electrophysiology platforms, so that's going to be expanding uh, in the coming uh, months and years. And then uh, so far we have about 1,000 clients uh, uh, historically, and then uh, they come from all over the world. Next slide. So uh, our main focus is still on biochemical services, biophysical, <coughs> and then uh, we do have the largest kinase activity panel in the industry, and we also have a very broad epigenetic panel. We also offer customized protein production and then assay development and screening, MOA studies uh, in both biophysical and biochemical formats. Then uh, we offer uh, in vitro toxicity experiments, um, as well as customized probe and lead generation. And when it comes to products, uh, our main products are recombinant proteins and enzyme, and we validate pretty much all of them for activity. So if you buy them from us, then most likely they will work. And then also we offer protein substrates mainly for uh, epigenetic uh, experiments. Also we offer epigenetic inhibitors, as well as a few kits. And then a smaller portion of uh, what we do is internal research that's funded by SBR grants, and then uh, we have a small uh, drug discovery collaboration project as well. Next slide. Uh, so kinase is the focus of this project, so I'm just going to go into that. So our panel consists of uh, 600 active kinases that include um, both wild types, mutants, and atypical kinases and they're broken down by type in the table below. And then this panel, the full panel is performed bi-weekly and uh, <coughs> standard conditions that have been optimized over time. And then, but we do offer customi customization and flexibility in terms that if you have specific interests and needs, we can adjust the assay conditions and then use uh, peptide substrates or protein substrate depending on what you're more interested in, as well as uh, vary incubation time buffers, et cetera. And then um, in the end, you get sort of a typical profiling tree uh, result. So the platform that's uh, used for kinase assay, we call it Hotspot, and it's a proprietary miniaturized assay platform. And we use radioactive ATP, which is a direct measure of kinase activity and still considered the gold standard um, in the field. And it's, the system is compatible with uh, peptide and protein substrates. Uh, there are no coupling reactions involved, and there's no compound interference since there's no fluorescent measurements. And then we use acoustic technology to deliver compounds into the reaction mixture, and this allows us to prepare all dilutions DMSO, and that minimizes any sort of precipitation effects. And then we do need very little uh, compound to test quite a lot uh, of proteins, and then the typical requirement will be, it, it depends on how many 
uh, enzymes you're testing, but something like 20 to 50 microliters of 10 millimolar stock will last a long way. And then the quantification of activity is uh, done using P81 uh, paper filter binding method. Next slide. Okay, so ALK2, uh, for ALK2 specifically, we have a total of uh, one wild type, obviously, and then four mutants. And then in the table, you can see uh, the substrates that used, and we do determine KM for ATP, but not the other substrates, and it's listed also in the table. So um, most constructs are very similar, mainly cytosolic domain, and then everything's made in insect cells. Uh, the tags are also listed in the table. And then two out of five proteins are homemade, and then everything else we normally uh, purchase from various vendors that offer the proteins. And then the standard ATP concentration assay is 10 micromolar, but uh, we can vary if needed. And then every protein has a data sheet. You can find them online where you see uh, control IC50s and then some other, uh, I think the other substrate concentration is also listed on the data sheet. And then finally, the last slide. So for other ALK targets, uh, we, we don't have the whole set, but I've listed everything else that we have other than ALK2. And then uh, in here, I'm only showing wild types, not the mutants, but we do have a bunch of mutants for ALK1. You can look online as well. And this sort of contains the same information for substrates used and then ATP, KM, et cetera, and then the enzyme source as well. And uh, that's pretty much it, but if you have some questions, I can try to answer as much as I can. Great. Anyone have any questions for, for Kate? No. Okay, thanks, Kate. That's, that's very helpful. And, uh, you know, again, we, we really appreciate it. I think, uh, you know, just to highlight that these are, are two of the mutants that are, are uh, significant uh, in, in DIPG. And so these ones are homemade proteins from RBC, and they've, uh, again, uh, allowed us to uh, profile our initial set of 30 compounds against these mutants. So uh, I think that, that that's great. So uh, again, thanks, Kate. I'm going to say the description from you, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We have a thing. The detergent we use to blow. One of them quite steep. Well, GW on the left, right? <coughs> was quite steep with the aggregation. The colloidal aggregation. This one? Yeah, yeah, but this one. Mm -hmm. What a steam. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, maybe you can ask. Okay. Mm -hmm. but, uh, yeah, I mean, we have full data and data sheets for the assays. And that includes enzyme concentration so that we know the limit of the assay. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I can send uh, by email, I guess, but a lot of them are online as well. Yeah, I just, I mean, the question's around uh, as we get potent in these compounds, with these uh, compounds, um, can we get a sense of the enzyme uh, assay detection limit? Yeah, it varies by different mutants, so I'll have to double check. Sure. I don't have it available right now, but I can gather that information for you. Okay, also a quick question for like the, these 30 compounds. What would be the turnaround to get all this data on them? A typical turnaround is two weeks, but uh, I guess the two RBC enzymes, since they're pretty new, I'm hoping everything will go smoothly, but we may have to uh, do some pretests before. So that maybe that'll be a little longer, but shouldn't be more than three weeks. Okay, and every compound right, right. is they will be screened across all. Is that the plan? No, no. We just we get three. the first thirty compounds. We have five assays, so I, I'll show you later what the plan is. But it's essentially these uh -huh. mutants up two and up five, mm -hmm. and then. The regular 20 compounds per month are tested against three kinases. So, and depending on what we see against these mutants, if there's one that we need to follow uh, to make sure that we're active, then that'll be one. Uh, out five is, mm -hmm. is another one, right? So, I think, you know, until we get that first set of 30 compounds, okay. defining what those other three will be is going to be uh, more challenging. So, we want to wait until we get that data to define the three. Mm -hmm. Hi, it's Sue in the UK. 
Um, just in terms of practicalities, is it intended that we'll batch up compounds and send a set of compounds, or are we doing it sort of from the three sites or from the various sites that are making compounds? Do we need to coordinate to make sure that it's uh, you know that we we know what we're doing and and which compounds are going? We're not going to. I know we're going to ship individually, but are we? It's a plan to all do it at the same time. I'm just thinking in terms of some of the practicalities. Yeah, um, yeah. Not, yeah, I think we definitely need to coordinate the shipment so that everything happens at the same time and then we yeah. fill up those 20 slots per month. So yeah. that, 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 I think, is a discussion item that, you know, we can have towards the end of the meeting, but yeah. uh, definitely okay. an, action, an action item that uh, I've taken note of. Um, I think uh, we have, and you'll see from our, our chemistry presentation uh, as well, that we have compounds that are all ready to submit. Um, uh -huh. But we're waiting until we get, you know, these, the results back from these 30 compounds and our database in place uh, before we actually yeah. submit them. There's, we, I think we have a couple, you know, two, three weeks before uh, we need to, to, to resolve this. But, uh, you know, I think we'll, what we'll do is we'll pick one date per month sort of thing and, and, and send, send the compounds in then uh, and, and yeah, coordinate sounds... back about how many compounds we have. Who are the people who are critical to that coordination, just you and Sue? I think for now it'll be Sue and I. Yeah, yeah. but I think that's the compounds are coming, uh, at least for now, only from our two sites. So, you know, I think uh, the coordination should be relatively facile, but, uh, you know, we'll yeah. just need to, to make sure. That's okay with you, Sue? Yeah, that's fine with me. I mean, uh, yeah, as, as you know, we're probably not going to produce compounds at the rate that you may well be, um, but <laughs> we'll do our best. That's, yeah, I think, yeah, no, I think uh, from what I've seen so far, you guys are doing great. So, you know, we look forward to your presentation later today. Um, all right, so I'll just give a, a quick overview as to, you know, some, some of what's happened uh, over the past month uh, or a month and a half, two months uh, since our last meeting. Uh, and I wanted to just give a, a brief overview of some of the things that have happened um, in the ALP2 field uh, over the last little while. Um, and, and I'll go through this quickly because we do have uh, some time limitations now. So BioChrist uh, announced in January that they've identified two IND candidates from their ALP2 inhibitor project. Now they're going to treat FOP, which a lot of companies are, and, uh, but they have these two IND candidates that they're profiling and they're, they think they should be in the clinic uh, the beginning of 2019 or essentially in about a year. So uh, I think that that's a, an interesting development. We don't have any information as far as I know about the structure of these two compounds. I haven't seen a patent um, and, and certainly no publications, but this is something to keep our eye on as we move forward. Um, just in terms of FOP and, you know, something to keep our, our, our eyes on as well is this Paloveratine um, that is from Clementia Pharmaceuticals. They they in license this this compound from Roche, and although it doesn't act directly on ALK2, uh, it does affect the downstream consequences of the overactivity of ALK2 that we see in DIPG. That's the uh, SMAD uh, signaling. So they they claim that this molecule. Um, inhibits MAD phosphorylation and increases the proteasome-mediated degradation of the, the relevant SMADs in, in, this, in this pathway. And they've generated some data in FOP, uh, some clinical data, uh, that, that looks like they're, they're decreasing bone formation uh, on insult. So I think although this isn't direct competition in terms of ALK2, it's, it's something to keep our eyes on in terms of it's still modulating that same pathway that's, that's, that's overactivated in, 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 in DIPG as a result of the ALK2 mutations. Um, as well, uh, there's a no, new Novartis patent that came out that, that Sue uh, pointed out uh, to me and was able to provide a copy uh, nice and early on. They uh, profiled their compounds against ALK2 and ALK3 in an ATP GLOW assay. Uh, they 
highlighted this compound, compound 34, uh, in the patent. Um, it was about 18 nanomolar against ALK2, relatively selective against ALK3. Um, you can see that they were able to dial out ALK1, but only you know, about tenfold uh, selectivity, maybe 15, uh, relative to ALK2. Um, and this is the FOP mutant. And then they were able to completely dial out ALK5 and ALK6 out of, out of this, this molecule. Uh, they had about a 50 nanomolar uh, activity in their luciferase assay, which I presume is pretty similar to the one uh, that, that we are looking at. So that's, that would uh, meet our target product profile. And they were able to show some in vivo efficacy again in a bone growth uh, assay. Um, so, you know, this looks relatively similar. We modeled this, the, uh, this compound, and it looks like this part is actually sitting in the solvent exposed area, uh, and this is mimicking the, the trimethoxy uh, group in, in our inhibitors, but it reaches further back into the pocket. And so you'll see in, in David Smeal's presentation later today that we're trying to use some of this information to, to try to build in some of the specificity that we need in our molecules as well. So, uh, you know, all of this is, I think, interesting and, and, and something that, you know, we should all, we should all keep our eyes on as, as the project moves forward. Um, very shortly after the uh, last meeting, uh, we had a, a, a chemistry planning session with Charles River, uh, looking at this kind of initial chemistry plan that was highlighted in the CTIP uh, presentation. Uh, and we divided up the work, uh, 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 you know, according to what, what's seen here. Charles River was taking care of these six analogs, and OICR was, uh, we're going to make these three analogs uh, to try to fill out this initial set of SAR um, that was presented in, in the CTIP application. So that work is still ongoing, and, and as I said, we have compounds that are ready su to submit, but we're waiting until uh, everything is in place so that we only have to do things once. Um, so we did take an initial set of 14 analogs and profile the compounds at Eurofins in their ALK2 and ALK5 assays just to get an initial snapshot of the SAR to make sure that you know, the thermal melt results that we were getting uh, made sense and kind of correlated with what we would see in a real enzymatic assay. And uh, so, you know, the compound shown here, 1062, is kind of the desmethyl analog of the, the lead compound. And uh, it was 14 nanomolar and showed about a 13-fold uh, selectivity, uh, ALK5 over ALK2. Now, when you introduce the methyl here, the lead compound has about 125-fold selectivity. Uh, ALK5 over ALK2. So that's a pretty big difference just by adding that methyl. Now, none of the analogs that we had at the time actually had this, this methyl in place. So we profiled basically uh, the analogs with only carbon, or so only hydrogen uh, at the posi this position of the, the pyridine. And so all of this, these selectivity numbers, we think we should be able to improve just by adding that methyl. And this is some of the things that are ongoing in, in our chemistry effort right now is to make some of the best in Jeff? Hello? Jeff, hi, Jeff. Yeah. Hi, Paul in Oxford. Um, I guess one of the concerns about adding the methyl to increase the selectivity is that it also hinders the potency on ALK2, so all the compounds get weaker. Um, right. So just keep right. in mind, you know, the trade off Right. That's something that, that, we've, that we've discussed. And so we are looking at making, so when we make new analogs, uh, we'll start by making them uh, in the methyl series, essentially, but we will spot check the best analogs with hydrogen, with the amine, and there's a methoxy and a chloro. Uh, you know, I think that all of these are, are worthwhile making, uh, but only spot checks. So definitely a good point, and, uh, you know, um, yeah, so there were a couple of uh, trimethoxy mimics uh, that retain similar levels of potency, you know, against both ALK2 and ALK5. Not sure that there's really that much of a difference in, in, in these numbers. Um, the methyl didn't seem to make a, a, a big uh, 
uh, difference, at least against ALK2, but it does seem to um, provide better ALK5 potency, so removing the methyl provides better selectivity. Uh, this is something that's interesting, and inserting uh, an amide spacer into this into this ring really was detrimental for the potency uh, ALK2 and ALK5. And a lot of this recapitulated, at least on uh, a, a large scale, what we saw in the thermal melt assays. So I think that that's great, but we do get a lot more texture in, in really profiling these analogs uh, in, their, in the enzymatic assays rather than in the thermal melt. Uh, again, yeah, yeah, but that link so, was in the Novartis compound there, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, I was. Yeah. Yes, it's the same. That's what I was going to come right. Down. Well, it was yeah, slightly different, but uh, yeah, I mean in terms of angles, but yeah. But yeah. Then you insert the amide, but you could see the group that the optimized was very different. Exactly. So, right. It was shorter. Yeah, I think. Right. And, and reached out more into this direction rather than so, you know. Um, yeah. But, I, I, but I, yeah. I, I mean, I Sorry, I don't think you want to ignore the amide link, particularly from what we saw from that Novartis patent. I think uh, finding the, uh, some of the ideas that you'll see that we've uh, come forward with, um, I think uh, you can include amide links, but you might need to modify the aromatic ring uh, somewhat. Right. Groups in different positions. Right. No, I think I think that's that, that, that's a great observation and. Yeah, it's something that we, we're, we're keeping in mind as well. I think uh, on our end, we're looking at reaching the same uh, part of the pocket through alternative means, but, you know, certainly uh, the amide does seem to be well tolerated, so we can't ignore it. Um, again, 1062 is the reference compound here. You can introduce a nitrogen in this ring. And, and again, I mean, all of this SAR uh, is not something that we were, that was unexpected, but it is good to get uh, the, the real numbers. This seems to uh, increase the potency. Um, uh, this is actually my table is a little wrong here. Uh, this is this is the ALK2 potency and this is the ALK5 potency. Everything kind of got shifted by by one. This is uh, CH versus N. Sorry about that. Um, incorporating the uh, an amine. Sorry. What shifted? Although oh, the M4 number in that column, like the right, one this is the M. That's the out two. That's out five. Right. This is out two and out five. So everything should be shifted over by one. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Thanks. The penny's just dropped. Yeah. yeah. I'll update this before we uh, upload the the, the slides. Um, inserting an amine was detrimental to both out two and out five. And uh, the, the, the triple bond here was also not very well tolerated with respect to ALK2. It did completely ablate the ALK5 activity. A um, couple of interesting results on this slide when we started looking at uh, more of the left-hand side molecule, of the part of the side of the molecule, the solvent exposed uh, region. Again, reference compound is 1062, uh, incorporating uh, a pyridine into, the, into this ring uh, did provide a slight improvement in the, in the selectivity against ALK5, uh, extending uh, the basic, basic ring uh, through an oxygen linker resulted in a molecule that was essentially equal potent. Uh, same thing uh, through here, moving from something basic to something non-basic didn't uh, affect the ALK2 potency or the ALK5 potency for that matter. But a couple of interesting results uh, we think on our end are this 1159 and 1158 that maintain good ALK2 potency, uh, but you know the ALK5 potency uh, moved up uh, to the, the two micromolar range so that these uh, appear to be the most selective analogs that we were able to uh, profile in this initial set of compounds. So this, these results are something that we're interested in following up on our end. Um, so we'll come back one. Yeah. So it's interesting if you look at the biochemical selectivity and then you compare it to the cell base selectivity, those can be very different. So yeah. I don't know what stage. So all of these analogs sh will be tested in the in the luciferase-based assays. Uh, Alex is working on that. So all of these analogs 
and all of the next set of 17 as well. We, we've coordinated this and Alex's team is working on getting the cell-based data, so that will be important. Uh, and does that take precedence, I guess, in terms of this criteria for the selectivity profile is going to be based on? Yeah, well, yeah, I think, uh, you know, it should because ultimately that's, that's what will drive the phenotype, right? So I, I think that uh, we need that data to, uh, to, to finalize any SAR plans, but I think, you know, we're getting that and hopefully at, at next month's meeting we'll have uh, all of the data for those 14 compounds as well as these new 17 compounds and, and we'll be able to, uh, to really make some good decisions based on data uh, from that. We will also profile all of these in, in our in vitro ADME assays as well. The, the initial set of compounds were already tested, but these 17 uh, will also uh, be tested. So uh, again, I mean, I think you know these are compounds that were previously made um, uh, in the UK and, and profiled there. And uh, you know we don't have IC50s for these compounds yet, and so I think getting that information, getting real enzymatic uh, assay data uh, for, the, for these is, is important. So uh, moving forward, we will get all, all of that data. All right. And that's all I have. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess, uh, I guess this is as good a place as any to, uh, to discuss this. So the initial profiling panel, uh, that we were thinking about for these 30 compounds at RBC is, is shown here. So looking at the wild Hello? Hello. Hi, Sue. Hi. You're yes, on. I'm here. I'm okay. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> so you're okay with um, yep. going, for, going forward with okay. your presentation? Do you have to? Oh, right. Okay. So, yeah. There we go. Okay. So, um, hi, everybody. Uh, sorry, I couldn't make it to the last meeting, um, but just thought I'd give you a general update on the progress that we've been making at Charles. River. As you know, uh, we're using crowdsourcing to uh, identify a K 
chemistry resource to be able to uh, give give to this project. Um, when we started off looking, trying to get, uh, gaining people's interest, we found that there's a lot of people who are really interested in participating. They're really excited about the opportunity. Some are providing ideas. We've got guys in CAD. Um, we've got people who want to do synthetic chemistry. Oh, yep, it's gone up to my full screen. Um, provision of anal analytics. Down the line, we've also got some people who, in our pharmaceutics uh, group, who are really enthusiastic, but obviously they, they can't really contribute anything at this stage. But down the line, there may well be um, opportunities for them to look at uh, potentially salts or polymorphs or anything that we might need to do to further down the line. So we've got we've got interest from a whole range of different people within the chemistry department. Um, we've been pro providing regular updates at our sort of chemistry department meetings so that they know what's going on and to try and maintain a degree of enthusiasm. And some of the, the teams, particularly the team at Chesterfield Park, where we've got quite a lot of relatively young uh, chemists who are really enthusiastic. We've sort of set up a lunchtime update session so that everyone knows what's going on. Our CAD scientists are working with the, the guys in the OICR um, <coughs> to make sure that we use the uh, the same docking grids, etc. So our um, site in Harlow, um, we've, we've uh, identified some people who were quite happy to do some chemistry. And um, whereas in Harlow, they're, they're, they're working more as uh, small groups so that they can pass the chemistry around. As I think Nicole has highlighted previously, we will have limited resource in February and March. We've got a major influx of new projects which we're trying to resource. And um, that's obviously going to have a knock-on effect um, on time that people might have to spend on this project. But we will do our best to make it up at a later stage. Um, and obviously we've helped out, I think I, I missed that part of the slides, I think I saw it written on the slides but I couldn't hear, but we've been providing uh, expertise on the MDCK, MDR1 assays to help predict blood-brain barrier penetration with assay protocols and cell sources. So just in summary, we've got more than 45 scientists who've, ex who've expressed an interest so far to participate in whatever way they can, so which is really you know, brilliant from... Uh, um, yeah. So Glory next slide, five. please. That's fantastic. So just in terms of the six compounds that Jeff highlighted <coughs> earlier, um, we've put together, we've, we've got stocks now of all the intermediates needed for, for the six of them, um, either purchased or, or where necessary we've prepared them. We've completed the synthesis of target in the red box, target one, where R is methyl. So that compound is ready to ship once we've actually agreed on, on, on all, uh, how we're going to do that. We've also kept back, obviously, the chloro intermediate is, is, is uh, the intermediate that's on the way towards the synthesis of that compound. Um, we had enough that we were able to hold back some of the chloro intermediate, so that's one where we can test that compound as well. So we've also initiated the synthesis of a couple of the other targets, so num number two and five. We've done the first couple of steps of those. So, you know, I think uh, it, it started well. So that work's been done at the Harlow site. And on the next slide, we've initiated the work towards the compounds in the blueprint patent. Um, <coughs> so look at, looking at the compounds on, on this slide, um, we've made the intermediate core um, that's required to put the put the synthesis together. Um, we've just started making the the, the required um, bromophenylpyridines needed for this. Um, so again, you know, some good progress uh, here. The CAD team have also, we also looked at, the, at this. I mean, I don't know what your feelings were about the, the docking of this compound. It seems to put the cyclopropyl in a region of um, uh, where there's a lot of waters present. So we're a bit um, <coughs> thoughtful around this as to whether that cyclopropyl, although it appears 
a lot in the patent um, how happy it is in that position in terms of the docking. <coughs> really interesting when we've made the compound to actually be able to get a crystal structure of that to see whether see exactly how it does sit because um, we had to do the docking in the absence of water. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, yeah. No, I think uh, you know our models look pretty similar uh, to that. They put yeah. the cyclopropyl in in a very similar area. So uh, again, yeah. I think uh, it is interesting, and we will want X-rays when when we do get it. Yeah. So I think yeah. we definitely want to ship to Oxford for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll have to go. Um, Hello. Sorry. Uh, I just thought yeah. someone else. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Alex yeah. just said he'll have a go crystallizing it. Ah, okay. Perfect. Um, so the the Merck patent compound. Um, so we've uh, started the first couple of steps towards the preparation of the benzimidazole. Um, they've been completed, and we have the intermediates for completion of the rest of the molecule. We're hopeful that that one will come out relatively quickly dependent upon uh, people being able to take a look at this. Again, our CAD team have docked the compound and it shows there were several uh, op options for how the, uh, the whether, which position the hydroxymethyl actually would sit and which group it was inter interacting with or whether it was interacting with the water. Um, but it clearly sits in that uh, hydrophilic pocket. So we're making progress with all of those compounds. So That's the great. next slide. Next, next slide, please. This one. Um, well, I think yeah, I think uh, Jeff's already talked about the uh, about this uh, this compound. So the or the Novartis patent. Um, so this was published on the 25th of January. Um, as uh, Jeff mentioned, the compound 34 is the one that they seem to do quite a lot of extra work on. It is a compound for FOP. Um, again, so the docking suggests a relatively similar positioning to our pyridine series. Um, and this is where we talk about the amide linker, which pushes the, uh, the, bicycle, the hydroxy bicycle sort of out into uh, towards the um, hydrophilic region. I think <coughs> when you overlay this with some of our other compounds, it looks that you know, you should you should be able to tolerate an amide linker in, in our series, which may well make things uh, a lot more interested. So I think, you know, when we've completed the synthesis of our other compounds, I think it would be worthwhile making a compound from this patent. Um, so we, I did the, I looked at the MPO score to see how likely it would be to get anywhere near the brain, and it's it's pretty low. I think it's highly unlikely you've got what. Well, Four H1 donors. It's highly lipophilic, um, and that, that means it's probably that particular compound is probably unlikely to get into the brain. So we could either make that compound or select a more suitable one that might have better physchem properties but still has good activity. So I think we should probably target making one of the compounds from this patent. I don't know what you think. Yeah, uh, are no, there analogs in the patent that look more CNS penetrant, less H1 donors? There, there certainly are some, yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes with compounds like those, because the amino tend to inherit only hydrogen one, sometimes there's some surprises in the permeability profiles. Yeah. It, sometimes calculations are not always predict. Oh, absolutely, yes. I mean, it may right. be that one of the NH, one of the H's on the NH2 is actually tied up in an internal hydrogen bond, so I'm not sure whether that's what you said. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah, it could be that if we insert the methyl instead of the NH2 yeah. as well, that you know we could get rid of two of those hydrogen bonds. Absolutely, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that might be a, a good uh, some, something to do as well. So yeah, I yeah. think uh, you know I, I like that you're thinking about which ones to make, and so you know I mean uh, I, I think this this could be a, a, another thing for for your team to take care of. So. Yep. Um, Happy, yeah. happy to take that on, and, and we'll go through we'll go through the patent a bit more carefully and um, take a look at perhaps a compound that's got a slightly better score, or we can make the the chloro methyl and uh, amine because you make the amine from the chloro anyway, so you you could envisage um, making those making the, the little set, but the the right. 
bit on the right hand side is relatively complicated and they do have some simpler ones which still retain potency yeah so I'll go through and, and have a look and uh, identify a preferred compound yeah yeah perfect okay so just in terms of new ideas we held two brainstorming sessions one at each site um, so we had good involvement we had somewhere approaching approaching 15 people from each of the two sites uh, involved so that was really really good um, we've got a wide range of different ideas ranging from those that were just close in modifications the sort of things that you know you guys have been <coughs> talking about as well we've looked at we came up with ideas of hybrids with other series and some much more speculative ideas to generate new chemical matter I know while it might not be necessary at the moment, I think you know we need uh, ultimately to have two two series as as I understand it, so you might want to think at some point or along the lines of ideas to generate new chemical matter right yeah yeah, okay, so if I just go through some of the ideas that they're still they're, they haven't really been refined or prioritized priority type <laughs> sorry prioritized at all um, but first of all looking at some other some other replacements for the heteroaromatic put for the aromatic the trimethoxyphenol ring so looking at replacing it by other heteroaromatics replacing one of the methoxies by pyridine nitrogen or you, you we've had the the indazole I think it is, is is the one that we've been to the methoxy indazole you could envisage the methoxy uh, benzimidazole as well or the quinoline, which appears in some of the other series. Um, then looking at incorporating the amide linker as in the Novartis patent. Okay, and, but we then made the quinoline in um, a publication. Sorry, so sorry? We, we made the quinoline um, instead of the trimethoxyphenol in the publication we had. And there was a... It's not as potent as in a different scaffold. So it's probably not optimized for the pocket shape. Right. Okay. Um, but we can dig out those data. Wait, uh, one, one more comment. Um, so the methoxy um, single modification, you know, the single substituted methoxy with other things, we made a lot of those. Um, and I think they're in that giant SAR table I sent you. Right. Um, okay. In general, they, they, were, they were worse. Um, so I'd just you know, maybe have a look and make sure you're not yeah. remaking one. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. We we would make sure that we're not remaking anything um, that's okay. been that's already been uh, been looked at. Oh. Yeah, I'm not sure that I've seen any of the ones that you have there, uh, the the methyl chloro or cyano, uh, hmm. in the, in that table. But uh, yeah, uh, I think. Uh, yeah. So from I mean, we all, we all. Sorry. Well, I was Sorry, just going to say, yeah, we have we have one SAR table that that kind of highlights uh, uh, what what's been done. Maybe I can recirculate that back around to make sure that uh, everyone has it and that that is the most exhaustive list that that is yeah. available. That would be good. I think um, from the docking, it looks like one of the methoxy groups doesn't really uh, participate in anything in particular, but it may be just participating electronically I guess so um, it doesn't seem to be uh, producing any particular interactions um, right. I think there was a light in sitting between the two methoxy groups actually yeah two between two of them but the third one doesn't seem to doesn't look like it does very much doesn't seem to have a water interaction or a lysine or so I, I don't know I think um, we probably need I, I know you've done some of the dimethoxys but the nitrile for example is is designed to pick up that lysine right yeah and then there's other things like on the right hand side an amide as an alternative uh, lysine interaction yep okay so the next slide so looking at uh, sub the pyridine substitution, so you've already talked about um, the amino compounds, I believe, are more potent but less 
selective. So we wondered whether if that methyl group is doing something on one side, maybe you could have the uh, having a minor on the other side, for example. Um, we weren't sure whether the methyl was introducing some sort of twist, so perhaps you could put the methyl between the two groups rather than uh, at the hinge. Um, uh, Sue, and then uh, Sue uh, we actually already made that compound here, so <laughs> right. uh, okay. stop you before. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, that brings up a really good point. So, I mean, I know that all of these are just ideas, and, you know, yeah. I, it, it's fantastic. We will, again, like coordinating the shipping, we'll have to coordinate yeah. any synthesis as well and keep each other apprised as to what molecules Absolutely. are. No. Yeah. These, these are all just ideas, and we haven't prioritized or uh, double-checked or anything, um, and we would check with you before we made anything. So, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. 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 So that, I guess that means it's a good idea, though. <laughs> <laughs> so also looking at other hinge binders like sort of the bicyclic uh, azeindole or using the quinazolinone, sort of taking from the quinazolinone series, but making it just a pyridone or a, um, a pyrimidone. So on the next slide, we were look, thinking about um, substitution on the phenyl ring or looking at more, have, sort of putting a, a non-aromatic ring attached to the pyridine. Or I think you might have had one of those compounds with the linker between the phenyl and the piperazine, between the phenyl and the pyridine. So I think I might have seen one on one of the earlier slides. So, uh, yeah, next slide. So then this was really just thinking about some of the other approaches to new chemical matter, looking at um, we could go back and look at further screening of the soft focus libraries if there's sufficient biology resource, but I guess um, if it's 20 compounds a month, then that may be perhaps not uh, available, but we could use a virtual screen to restrict down. I know that some of the compounds came from some of the biofocus, soft focus libraries originally, so there may be something else in there that hasn't been investigated. Um, someone suggested library synthesis around putting groups out to explore a range of different lysine binders. Um, we were already looking at macrocycles in the uh, pyridine series, but are there any options for macrocycles in the quinazoline series? And then thinking about some of the uh, inhibitors of other, there's a lot of in inhibitors out there, of, for example, ALK1. Um, and is there some way that we can take an ALK1 inhibitor and convert it to uh, an ALK2 inhibitor? Or can we take, alternatively, look, start to look at compounds that have good brain penetration, kinase, kinase inhibitors such as EGFR inhibitors, and try and look to see how we might be able to introduce ALK2 activity into that. It says using available, and I've obviously forgotten to finish that sentence. So literature and, and uh, modeling was what that was, that was meant to say. Uh, mm. So on the next slide, there's a, um, there was a, just an example of there's a, this AstraZeneca PAN-ALK inhibitor in a MedChem communi communications from 2016. Um, so this is actually an ALK1 inhibitor, but well, if you read through the text, um, it says that it's about 1.6, 1.2 nanomolar on ALK2. Um, so I thought, well, is there some way that we could reduce the ALK1 and ALK5 activity on that, such as uh, putting in um, a methyl group on the um, on the pyridine, um, or using the amide linker on on the side that heads out towards the solvent. Um, so it's just a few thoughts around what else we might be able to do. So that's where we're at at the moment. We have, As I say, we haven't prioritized. There's, there's a lot of ideas out there. The brainstormings were at the end of last week. So there's a lot of ideas out there that need to be sort of distilled down and refined and, and prioritized. And then obviously we would need to discuss with you who, who should be making them uh, and and that, but uh, that's where we're at in, right. uh, in Charles River. Can I ask a question to the general group? Uh, 
when you're looking at the prioritization of which camera, which compounds to pursue, or et cetera, and look at, are you starting from the the compounds that are going to most likely penetrate the blood-brain barrier? Are you starting from and then, and then modify those, or are you starting from things that already show some L2 inhibition, and then looking back to do the blood-brain barrier cross? And my question from that is, shouldn't we be starting with those ones with uh, maybe not the most potency, but do cross the blood-brain barrier more so and prioritize those over the other ones? I'm just, in general, question, comment, where's the thinking going? So, so the lead compound uh, from the series, the pyridine series, that you know, which is the, the basis of the project, does penetrate the brain to a certain extent. They showed some relative, you know, some uh, efficacy in an in vivo model. Uh, it was, you know, only a uh, Kaplan Meyer. So, you know, I, I don't think that 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 yeah. compound is optimal, but it does appear to get into the brain. So that's why we are starting with with, with that series of molecules. And then, you know, looking at this MPO score, yeah. right, that uh, for, the, for the various molecules, that helps at least prioritize which molecules have the potential to get it, uh, to cross the blood-brain barrier. So we are using that as well. I think, um, you know, there are some ideas on, on our slides as well as on, on I think, some, some here too that, you know, have more or less um, Likelihood of crossing uh, the blood-brain yeah. barrier, but but I but I we do agree. I think that you know prioritizing molecules that do have that do have the potential or have molecular and features like that people's uh, space too that way. So the the other L2 programs tend to be on FOP, which they don't seem to, they don't care that much. No, in fact, they don't stay want outside their IP space. No, I was just looking at the, the the compound that's on the on this the screen right now. Okay. Was, sorry? Yeah, this right. is the lead compound, right? Yeah. This is the one that does show some brain damage. It does show some brain damage. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, the, 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 the AstraZeneca one on the top right, though. This one? Yeah, no, that's, that's, this yeah. doesn't have any. I'm yeah. sure this has zero brain penetration. <laughs> but, yeah, no, because it's, it's the AstraZeneca program. Right. Yeah. Um, the, the lead compound also had the brain exposure level measured, not just the survival in the efficacy model. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. I think one thing probably get, I mean, molecule is nice and small. Sometimes, like, to, to EGFR program, people have done it, like, if you put flow in atoms next to some of those NHs, that can actually facilitate mm -hmm. CNS penetration. That's a technique people have used to get a lot of um, EGFR inhibitors that are work very well, start getting them entered into the brain. So. You know, based on the small size, because CNS compound, the smaller they are, they actually work in your favor. I mean, based on that small size, if there's any little chicks you could use, yeah. to kind of minimize the hydrogen and donor potential for them. Right, I mean, you'll see some of our SARs, you know, stay pretty close to this structure, because it's, yeah. it's really not that bad, yeah. right? I mean, uh, we don't have much IP space there, but at least to generate a tool compound, uh, to demonstrate proof of concept, you know, it's, we're pretty close. If we can get, you know, an improvement in, in potency against L2, an improvement in selectivity, then, then we're really close to being there uh, already. So we've got some more far-fetched ideas, and we've got some ideas that are really close to, to the lead scaffold as well. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Okay. okay. Um, I think that was my last, last slide. Yeah. All right, uh, David. Um, do we want to do Alex? Or? Alex is there? Al yeah, I don't know if Alex. Did you have a slide other than that one that you sent me? If you want to show the one I sent you, we can just mention that a minute. Yeah, let me see if I have it. Okay. Yeah. Um, I can dig up some slides here if you want to share the screen with us. But maybe that's introducing too much complexity given the troubles we had. Yeah, no, I have it. I have it. We're a little gun shy over here by doing anything. Yeah, yeah, let's not let's not mess. I'm scared to even move the microphone. Yeah. So from a from an Oxford point of view, some of these other patented molecules, the Novartis molecule, the blueprint molecule maybe even a Merck molecule, whatever you have. I mean, maybe testing those on the DIP patient cells 
looking at you know the the effects on proliferation. I think as well as the the IC fifties and potencies in the chemical <coughs> assays, just seeing what kind of chemotypes are having efficacy on the patient derived cells would also be uh, a, a nice set of data to have right at the beginning of the project. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, especially ones that we know that are on target. And, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, Jeff mentioned the dual luciferase assays we have. So those are transcriptional reporter assays on the bad <laughs> promoter elements. They give us really nice IC50, quite straightforward assays. But in parallel, we've been working with Promega to develop a nanobret assay. So here we have a, a tracer compound, a fluorescent compound that binds to kinase ATP pocket. And then we have a nanolook uh, cloned on a nanolook construct cloned onto the ACBR1 C terminus, the out to receptor C terminus. And this gives a breadth signal. And then we can displace the tracer with our compounds. And this assay was optimized with a tracer generated by SGC. And then uh, Promega have now sent us that new tracer in the last few days. Uh, John Fu, who's sitting beside me, has just been rushing that into some cell assays. And the slide here just presents some data from a couple of days ago testing different concentrations of the tracer. And so you can see on the bottom, um, these are single in this case, not triplicate. But you can see at different tracer concentrations, basically, the one compound here, the RP50s, are quite reproducible. Um, He's now generated data just yesterday, which was then trying this in triplicate. The data looked beautiful, very small error bars. He's also tried some miniaturization, so a 3.8 four-well plate, as well as different 96-well plate volumes. And he's also tried expanding this to four compounds instead of the one compound here. All of those data look similar quality to the slide here. And we can forward that to you, Jeff. Um, so we think this is a really, really nice assay, possibly even to replace the luciferase assays. So we had a direct readout on the receptor over a transcriptional reporter. Obviously, we can do both in parallel to kick off. I need to contact Promega to see where they are in terms of having this assay for ALK5. But in theory, I think our tracer should work with ALK5. It's quite a promiscuous tracer compound. And in theory, we can take our ALK2 construct and just clone in the different DIPG mutations. Um, so in theory, we could have a panel very similar to the reaction biology uh, panel with the same set of mutants and the same uh, ALK homologs, ALK1 and ALK5. That would be the, the hope. Um, so I think for the next month, we would take the 30 compounds that Jeff mentioned, we'll try and generate the dual luciferase data, the out to nanobret data, and in the meantime, chase Promega on the adaptability of this assay to ALK1, ALK5, and ALK2 mutants. It may be possible for us to do that in-house. Um, yeah, that'd be great. Think, do we have anything else to add, Paul? John Fu? No. Oh. Okay, th thanks. I think uh, you know that that looks really good. If we can uh, get the uh, the uh, mutant data as well, and and, and the L five, I think you know this assay format looks looks extremely good. So it'd be it'd be good to line everything up with our uh, in vitro uh, enzymatic assays as well. So uh, this is great. Okay. Um, and then the other right. thing you can do with this assay is the residence time as well. So you can look at kinetics. With that environment. Wow. Okay. Yeah. All right. How are we doing, Tom? So we are. Yeah. Why don't you actually be really quick because uh, Sue's presentation um, is making portions of mine quite redundant because we are all traveling in the same chemical space, so a lot of the ideas are the same or very similar. 
uh, at the very least. So um, here on OIC Earth End, we just have myself and uh, Dave McLeod making molecules with, uh, with Jeff uh, and other people uh, from the team uh, contributing ideas. So we're kind of cooling things and, and sorting through things, uh, like Sue mentioned on her end, also a little bit on the fly. And I think Sue's presentation also really highlighted the fact that we need a mechanism by which we can readily uh, stack our compounds against, uh, against each other so we're not making the same things, uh, which I see is already uh, starting to happen a little bit. Um, that's, the, uh, that's the lead series we're, uh, we're working from. Um, I think Paul had mentioned that uh, putting this uh, methyl group, which uh, introduces selectivity, uh, uh, into this compound uh, knocks the uh, IC50 back a bit, but it's not too bad. It's only a little bit of a marginal decrease. Uh, so that methyl group actually, I, I think, is something, given the, the amount of selectivity that it affords us, uh, is not a bad group to preserve in a lot of the uh, early stage SAR, uh, actually. Um, this is the kind of uh, slide that everyone's seen, uh, the overarching SAR for this uh, series, based on the kind of limited set of compounds uh, which has been looked at so far. So there are some general trends and ideas to, to kind of think about. Um, but in terms of uh, what we're going to be looking to modify going forward is we're going to keep this peridyl core the same uh, and this uh, trimethoxy arrow is something that we're going to try and replace as Sue has also uh, alluded to and also looking at this uh, solvent exposed um, paparazine portion, arrow paparazine portion. So those are kind of the two main areas which we're going to be operating in uh, and then a little bit less so in this kind of linking region and some of the core modifications such as the methylation here that I mentioned, uh, putting the nitrogen there, etc. Uh, some of which have already been done in the past. Uh, the nice thing for this project is that we have crystal structures available uh, and based on those, uh, again, I hear OSDR has developed a nice docking facility for us where anyone who's interested can put their smile string in and, and you know, take a look at their ideas, uh, see how they work and uh, we can put those into the pipeline uh, in terms of things to make. So that, that's a really handy thing to have uh, going forward. Uh, as Sue had mentioned, uh, this is the, uh, how we apportion the initial work. Uh, based on what we're going to be doing at the OICR and, uh, and what the Charles River uh, folks are doing. Uh, I think initially it looked like they were going to confine themselves to uh, modifications around this region, but as you saw from Sue's presentation, they've obviously been thinking far beyond that, um, as is the kind of the, the general idea here to, to modify uh, not only the pocket side portion, but also the solvent side portion as well. Uh, these are the analogs that we had discussed in the C-tip uh, and how we're, uh, we're going about apportioning those. So we're making the ones uh, indicated and uh, Sue talked about the ones that they're going to be making at Charles River, so you've seen that before. Just a quick comment on the chemistry here. Uh, if we're staying close to the, uh, to the initial uh, lead, uh, then it's just a, a matter of uh, creating these compounds through um, sequential Suzuki couplings, uh, which is quite straightforward. There's a number of catalytic systems and, and ways available to do that. So you can first install your pocket side fragment and then your solvent side fragment you're choosing in a very kind of efficient uh, convergent manner. And alternately, if you want to look at a different linker, either an oxygen or nitrogen down here, uh, you can do the similar uh, thing. Put your pocket side fragment in and then do couplings uh, on the bottom. So this is nice in the sense that it allows you quite a bit of latitude in terms of uh, the structure that you want to make. Uh, given that the compound is so modular, uh, you know, the, the starting materials and, uh, and the pieces for it are quite readily available, either commercially uh, or because we have some FTEs available. Uh, we've been getting some of the common intermediates uh, made for a lot of these compounds. So we're building up stocks of some of the more kind of uh, uh, utilitarian uh, building blocks, which we can then uh, exploit the fire on a bunch of either the pocket side or the solvent side pieces uh, as we see fit. So, some of these are, uh, are almost completed and some of them are in progress, so we're kind of ordering these and, and feeding them into the pipeline as we go along uh, as pieces for the future. Um, one of the things that we have highlighted from our SAR from the re-screening of the initial set, uh, which we had done at Eurofins, is that these compounds with these uh, indazines uh, on the bottom, on the solvent side, um, uh, sorry, the indoles rather, uh, on the solvent exposed side, is that they're showing uh, some actually decent uh, selectivity over ALK5, uh, which is uh, almost trying to approach the level of those with the methyl group at this position. So that's one of the things that we've uh, currently been working on, is to, um, is to remake these analogs with the methyl group up top, and so those are uh, actually complete, uh, and they should be uh, shipping uh, in the next batch once we, once we figure out what we're going to be testing against. Uh, interesting thing is when you dock them uh, is you can't fully rationalize necessarily why that selectivity is, is taking place based on the docking model. Uh, one appears to form uh, an H-bond um, to this, I believe it's a, um, 
This is D293. Yeah, uh, this one forms no such H bond. Um, so it's a little bit uh, difficult to see why they're uh, equipotent, um, but perhaps as the uh, SAR evolves, we'll begin to understand a little bit more about this. Uh, so one of the things that we can also do is that uh, has been talked about introducing different linkers to get that uh, solvent exposed fragment uh, onto the molecule and here's just one idea with an amide and you can see we're again capturing that H bond to the DT93. So there's of course a wealth of things that we can do uh, along these lines. Uh, these are the key interactions uh, from the paper uh, which we're looking at. We're looking at the E248, uh, D354 and the lysine 235 and of course if we can get rid of that water. So those are some of the things that we're, we're going after structurally. Um, here's an idea in terms of uh, taking the aryl group and modifying uh, some of the pendant uh, groups on it. Here's an example of oxetane, which docks nicely reaching out uh, to the lysine. So uh, that's, that's one thing we could potentially look at. Um, there's also a number of other modifications we can make around um, the sky's the limit in terms of ideas. Um, here you see one uh, engaging uh, a, a different residue, um, some different orientations. Uh, here's one again uh, engaging a tyrosine, I believe, here. So there's a, there's a number of options in terms of uh, things we can do. And if you take a look at the glide score, some of them uh, score quite well. Uh, the original uh, score is around, I think, somewhere around nine, minus 9.5. So you, you can see some considerable improvement versus the parent, uh, at least in terms of the docking. So um, here's an idea which uh, also docks really well. Uh, this is, again, reaching out here. Uh, this E, I forget which one it is. Um, so you can see H bond uh, across here. So again, a little bit of a more out there idea in terms of we're introducing a lot more header atoms, but still uh, we may pick up some nice potency. There. And so uh, as was discussed by Jeff, once we have these compounds, they're going to go and be screened at reaction biology. So we're just trying to uh, work out how we're going to be doing that. And I think, again, the most important thing is that we go back and we plan uh, who's going to be making what. Um, so far, myself and Dave McLeod have been making compounds for a couple of weeks now. We already have uh, more than a dozen ready to go, so um, we'll get those into the pipeline. That's it. I mean, one good question I have. For the lead compound, it's an NH. I know there's a little bit of information about the N-methyl. Normally for CNS penetration and stuff, the N-methyl compound probably offers you better CNS penetration. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I've, I haven't heard enough comments on um, what's the issue with it. comment on that. Um, when we put the N-methyl analog into the PK study um, mm -hmm. with the original sort of four analogs, and it seemed to be toxic to the animals. It wasn't well tolerated. So that's why we went to the NH. Now, that may just have been that compound, but that's just something to keep in mind. We did it with three, you know, three closely related compounds. Yeah. They're pretty much all toxic. No, no, but only with the N-methyl, yeah. Yeah. So what uh, could you come, What kind of toxicity do you saw? Basically, like CNS type tox, or just I mean, and is it uh, specific? I have to go back and look. Um, I yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. I have to go back and look at the data. And was that a cause? All tolerated. I, I don't know if it was CNS tox, but they had the same CNS penetration as the other one, so it wasn't like they got a massive boost in CNS penetration with those. Okay. What was the dose uh, in administration of the drug? And so that's a comment we'll, you think we'll, you can we'll make? I'll send you all the data. Yeah, that'd be great because I don't I think, think we've seen this toxicity data before. And then you get it on. They didn't do a proper, you know, tox. It was just observational. They just noticed this with some of the compounds is all. And it does apply to all N-alkyl compounds, or just you only just have the N-methyl as one example? The only N, the only ones that were tested with N-methyl. We never made any other longer alkyl. Because it might be good to look at other N-alkyl group, groups on next. I mean, N-methyl yeah. has always got the N-dimethylation issue, but... Uh... Mm -hmm. Yeah, the morpholine as well is... Yeah, it's yeah. quite well tolerated and, and you know, might be more amenable to brain penetration as well. So that's that's another one that we thought was interesting yeah. to follow up on. Okay, great. Thanks, David. I think that's it. Yeah. Okay. Um,
Looks like we're going to finish just on time. I think uh, Owen has a... I'm going to spend two minutes, if I can, just on, uh, first on the operation side, on the database, et cetera. So um, I'm very happy to say that we actually were able to cash our first grant check, so therefore we can actually roll out some of this stuff. And it's a great moment in the, in the progress of M4K. Um, so we do need to centralize and control the data uh, going forward. It's one of our commitments. Um, to be able to move this program past this grant. So to that point, we're actually starting to look at some cloud-based products being reviewed, and it'll be a way to uh, centralize the data or the information that comes out of this. And we'll be rolling that out more over the next, by the next uh, project meeting. Hopefully that'll help um, be a centralized depository so we can see what everyone's doing, et cetera, and keep it very simple and very accessible to everyone else and under control. On the next slide, just very quickly on the uh, a little bit about uh, where we are on the uh, website and uh, other work. I think everyone who knows her, she's uh, joined us and has been taking the charge on this. And why don't I let you uh, give a little bit of a view, if you don't mind, and introduce yourself as well. Sure. Um, so I'm Eddie Joshua, and for those who don't know me, um, I will be working with M4K on the communications and PR side. Thank you, Owen. <clears throat> so the last two weeks, we've been uh, focusing on, on building and improving the online presence for M4K. Um, and uh, the first part of that is the website. So um, as you can see on the slide, we are looking at uh, third parties to help us with uh, redesigning and updating into a multi-page website. Um, the, we'll, so we're focusing the next month on building or developing new content, uh, which as Owen mentioned earlier, it would also highlight our partners and collaborators. So I will be in touch to ask for information to help achieve this uh, from uh, from those who are on the line and also in the room. Um, the website will also feature, uh, the landing page will be a blog-like page that will have, uh, will be a hub for information that's relevant to M4K, so news on the IPG, open science, and of course, um, M4K's progress. It would also host the recordings of the monthly update meetings and any other files. So the objective here is to provide a mechanism to share um, the open access uh, information, as well as build awareness of M4K so we can, uh, we can build connections and partnerships. The other aspect of this is the M4K social media presence. So um, we have a Twitter and a LinkedIn account. There's also a YouTube channel uh, that will host all of the recordings from these update meetings, um, a Facebook page coming soon. Um, and the objective is to have all this launched by February 28th. Um, that is the rare disease day, and so it would be great to build on the attention online and the buzz around rare diseases and uh, bring some more awareness to M4K's mission. And so um, I'll be in touch with um, most of you, if not all of you, very soon, but if you have any questions or comments, uh, we can circulate my my email uh, maybe with the minutes or the next agenda so that people can get in touch. Thanks. And just one last thing, uh, we've been talking about making this available to the greater public. Uh, we didn't advertise it too much in this meeting because we wanted to do a test drive to see how the technology works. We have a lot to debrief and debug, it would appear from the way we started off. But for the next meeting, we're hoping to make it uh, through the social media and make it more available to others as well. So we'll try that out. But uh, we will take it, especially people on the line, love to know what the snafus were uh, from your end as well, so we can get these um, solved for the next meeting. And that's it from that side, so back to you, Jeff, if you want. Yeah, no, I think, uh, again, I mean, other than the uh, initial setup issues that we had, you know, Angela did a great job to, to set that up and to, uh, thanks, and to work through the, all of the issues. And so thanks, Arie and Angela, for, for, for working through that. I think it's been a great meeting. I think uh, you were just starting to generate some data and some, some ideas. I think that's all exciting. We have a few you know, logistical things to, to continue sorting out before the project is fully up and running. But I think you know by the next meeting in March, we should have sorted through all of those database issues and compound submission uh, issues, coordinating the shipping, coordinating to make sure there's no duplication in the chemistry effort. Uh, you know, these are all things that we'll make sure that we accomplish over the next month. And, uh, you know, I look forward to the next meeting when we actually have a, a full data set on those, on those 30 compounds. I think that that's going to go a, a long way to, uh, to, to pointing us in the right direction to, to drive the SAR. 
So is, does anyone online have any questions, comments, suggestions? Jeff, this is Alex in Oxford. I had one question. Um, Alan Edwards has set up this open lab notebook system for some of the SGC staff funded by patient groups, for example, the brain tumor charity. And so his idea is that he's sort of a, he has a lab scribbles blog as well as uh, a Zenodo lab notebook, which is open. And I know he's quite keen for the M4K project to be an open kind of lab notebook project from, from our side. But we want to clear that with your team first. What will be the mechanism? Because we've discussed in the past having regular releases of data to protect our um, chemistry. Right. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, this is an open source project. And I mean, we've talked all along about making SD files, you know, uh, Excel files of, of SAR data available on the M4K website. Um, just speaking from OICR's perspective, I, we won't be making our lab notebooks public, um, but uh, you know, certainly all of the SAR data and uh, and uh, you know, all, of, all of the chemistry and all of these slides, uh, this is this is certainly something that that, that we will do. In June. So we don't necessarily need to make every single note we take open, but we'll have a regular release of some notebook material just updating what's going on. Exactly. Yeah. If you want us to clear anything with you before we release it, we can always do that too. I think on the, on the biology side or the x-ray side, I don't think that we will have any, any real issues with, with clearing. I think uh, it is an open source project. I think we're all we're all on board with that. I think it's a, it's a great idea, and you know, I, I don't think that there will really be any clearance. No, I, I don't think that there, there will be an issue. Um, we should think about the logistics for it. Aries, you're very much involved with this, aren't you, with uh, the uh, yeah. SGC? So perhaps uh, we can talk about this offline from this whole conversation mm -hmm. and go to that, go to that, at least for the biology side, and then once that's up and running, you can look at it from the OICR side and see if any of this makes sense from your side as well. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, and, and um, I was hoping that Alad is still online in case he wanted to add anything. Sure. Um, so um, as most of you know, we do have a, a group of lawyers and law students who are helping with um, the legal um, you know, counseling for M4K, and one of the things that they are working on is, um, you know, how is it that we can share data but still protect protect the IP so that no one would, you know, take that package and, and run with it. And maybe that's something we we can um, we can have an update about next time. Um, I think um, maybe one of the students or the the, the lawyers can uh, can attend and, and provide an update on, on the mechanism. So it would be some sort of a, uh, a screen that would pop up saying, uh, you know, you're viewing open access information, you consent to not use it for any regulatory filing or some, you know, some variation of that. So um, the details are still being worked out. But I think Al is, he's, he's lost sound and... and no, he's, um, no, we purposely yeah. cut him off so he can't speak. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> or chat, yeah. So, um, so that, I think that would be good to know what's, how to type in. Okay. Anything else from anyone? Jeff, thank you very much for running this. I really appreciate it. It's been, it's been yeah. good. And uh, we'll keep charging forward on that. Yeah. Yeah. And Angela, thank you for setting it up. You're welcome. Right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you very much, Thank you for your partners. Bye.